Welcome, my Mercurial Mercenaries. It's Halloween, and I thought we'd do something a little different for Halloween. I once did a playthrough of John Carpenter's soundtrack for Halloween, and it got zero views, so we're going to do something similar again, and probably achieve zero views again. That's not your problem. That's my problem. We are going to delve into the world of soundtracks. Horror soundtracks, for it is Halloween, if I haven't mentioned that once before, or twice or three times. It's Halloween. I'm a fan of horror, have been, lifelong, and strangely, only relatively recently did I get into The Exorcist, probably the king of all horror films. A film so great, I feel it transcends the horror norm. The kinds of films that the Oscar elite sort of look down at. They, I mean, they look down. They put it as low down as they can and they spit on it. But this is one of the greatest films of all time, regardless of it being a horror. And again, relatively recently, I got into the Italian giallo. I don't know if, you, if I'm pronouncing that right. Put it on the screen. Giallo. G-I-A-L-L-O. Genre. This is a subset of horror thrillers from like the late 60s, 70s, into the 80s. Italian, some very defined rules. Loosely, from my experience, you have a series of murders perpetrated by some unknown person, usually wearing black gloves. And then you have like an amateur sleuth, like a Miss Marple type character, uh, solving it all. That's just from my limited experience. Look it up on Wikipedia if you want to see what Jalo really means. But I started getting into them. The first one I bought was George Hilton and Anita Strindberg, starring in Le Code de Scorpion. And I got into other ones like we got uh, uh, Labrinto de Vetro. Shh. <laughs> and oh, this one is fantastic. The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. This one's directed by Dario Argento. And what I've discovered... What I've discovered about Giallo films is Dario Argento is a bit of a genius. He should be, in my opinion, and I guess it's just my opinion, he should be held up there with the likes of uh, Hitchcock and Scorsese. And he probably is. And the soundtrack we're going to listen to today, this is one of my favourite, if not the favourite, horror soundtrack. And it's for a film called Profundo Rosso, Deep Red. And what usually happens with uh, soundtracks, ones that you hold in high regard, they're usually intrinsically entwined to the film they come from. So if the film's good, you think of the soundtrack as being good. If you listen to the soundtrack after you've seen the film, as you're listening, you see the scenes from the film. The soundtrack evokes the film. To listen to the soundtrack without having seen the film? That's an interesting one. That really is. And you'll hear people say, oh, so-and-so soundtrack's really good. And then you'll listen to it, but you've got no knowledge of the film it comes from. Is it good? Or is it because the film was good? That is a separate discussion. I know my friend, uh, Bill Ryan, is into soundtracks and often say, Mercurial number six, you need to listen to this soundtrack. Uh, it's, we're talking about gaming soundtracks, um, movie soundtracks, and I've loved cinema scores. I've loved music from TV and film. But like I say, I've always kind of had the visuals playing at the same time, rather than shut myself away. But here is a soundtrack for a film, and this one's like no other, in my humble opinion. We're gonna listen to Goblin playing the soundtrack to Profunda Rosso, Deep Red. Now straight away, this is so 70s prog, but it's because Goblin are a 70s prog rock band. And let's face it, one of the best 70s rock bands to have a band of this absolute skill playing on your movie soundtrack really is something. And what you'll find when you watch uh, Dario Argento's films, because he worked with Goblin a lot, is, like I said earlier, the visuals and the sound just do that. So if you haven't seen the film, this might not be conjuring any images in your head. However, 
it's probably just not conjuring the same images in your head because you haven't seen the film. But I think all music conjures something in your head. Even if it's only a, a deep red colour, because I keep talking about deep red. Now, I would say one of the kind of signature moves on this particular score, on this particular soundtrack, is the unison playing of the instruments. You have guitars and basses and keyboards all playing the same thing together in unison. But it was from a time before getting tuning absolutely, well you could, no let's face it, you could get tuning dead on, there were analogue ways of getting instruments in tune. What I specifically like about this set of work is especially the guitars and the bass just slightly out from each other, which I'm trying to gives a beautiful power and there are moments in a horror film where you need power you might be talking about a knife through flesh every individual player the goblin is at the top of their game. Just feel yourself conducting it. You can conduct it in your mind. so much amazing use. Dropping instruments out, having time signatures change, drum fills carrying over silence. I mean the film itself, Deep Red, it's like a murder mystery. And what I like is the fact that you would have a beat, this up-tempo, soundtrack and such thing, because usually you're talking about ominous uh, keypads, um, orchestral swells, atonal melodies, and you've got just this like prog rock band. I mean, that might be my... <laughs> Whoa! My second ever mistake with a knife. Ooh. Oh, I don't even see that. Ooh. You can't see it. It's alright, you can't see it. Don't look. Jalo is about the thriller. One of the first ones I've bought. The Curse of the Scorpion, I think it's called. La Coda Le Scorpion. The Case of the Scorpion's Tale. It's about a bloke going on holiday, and while he's on holiday, stuff happens. And he solves it. And it's usually the amateur that solves it. 
over and above the police. Jesus Christ, can you see that? I'm dripping blood on the floor. I'm dripping blood on the floor. I'm dripping blood on the floor. what I find on this particular soundtrack. And I suppose, by definition, and on all, the, all of Goblin's work, um, is the fact that I seem to pick out the bass. And it might be because I I just, I think, if I had to pick one instrument to play now, today, if I could choose to be in any band, or to choose to create a band, I think the bass is the most fun. Perhaps drums first and foremost. But that, that, I've just always had a thing about the link up. To, so I'm slurring my speech a bit because that really hurts. You can't see it because I've. We can do it. You can see that? Oh, it's just dripping. It's just dripping. Oh. I've always been fascinated between the link up, between the bassist and the drummer. It's like they're looking at each other in the eye. <laughs> in fact, I used to be in a band where the bassist would have to keep looking at the drummer in the eye just to remind him what the hell he was supposed to be playing. That's kind of a different story. <sighs> ah, Jesus Christ. See that? Oh. Oh. Actually, it really hurts. Oh. As far back as um, watching like Live After Death of Iron Maiden, just watching the link up between Nico McBrain and Steve Harris. Uh, I've always found the link up between the bass and the drums of any band. Almost like their defining characteristic. The rest of the world will look at the singer and the guitar player. You'll constantly have like, they'll be looking at Morrissey and Johnny Marr or uh, Robert Plam and uh, Jimmy Page. I mean, pick any band you want. I watch Daltrey, Pete Townsend, but everyone really should be looking at John Paul Jones and John Bonham. Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr. Because without that bedrock, you've got jack shit. Remember the difference of a soundtrack as opposed to just listening to an album? Is that the band or the individual is making every effort to have a link up of action on the screen and to cre be creating music that feeds off the action of the screen or. helps the action on the screen, or portrays the action on the screen. Here's another massively defining piece of music from the film. And just listen to the kind of, the unison play here now, right? So in the right ear, you've got the guitar playing the main riff, right? Now the bass is joining in, but listen, just slightly out of tune with each other. And this is something people will do on purpose today. You'll get the guitar to play, guitarist to play something twice. And you'll just shift the pitch of one of them by a couple of cents. But back in the olden days, when people used to tune their guitars using horseshoes, this just happened naturally. Listen to this. This is 1970s natural. No artificial enhancement. Oh, 
Ah! Ah, Jesus Christ! Ah! Oh. Oh. Ah! Oh! God, can you see that? Oh. Tell you what, in 139 episodes, that's only the second time I've ever cut myself with that knife. <sighs> Had to be during a horror film soundtrack, didn't it? But I've always been fascinated in the uh, relationship between audio and visual in, in films, in movies. And I think um, it was Alfred Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock did a little piece on it. You could probably YouTube it. He plays the same scene with different types of music over the top and shows that the visuals are nothing without the sound. I mean, it's hard to say they're nothing without the sound because obviously you had silent film and people watching silent film would, would have something to say about that. Visuals aren't nothing without sound. The sound does more than just compliment. Sound makes. Blood on the tracks. Blood on the queue, number six is studio floor. Blood on Mercurial, number six in studio floor! This was the band's, just checking the screen. For the first time, give me, give me credit here, this was Goblin's first um, time working with Argento, and Argento went back to them again and again. And probably one of them, uh, Goblin's most famous pieces of work that you may have heard would be something like the soundtrack to the, the soundtrack to George Romero's *The Dawn of the Dead*. There were a couple of different soundtracks to that film, but um, God, it's bleeding. But um, one version, the European cut cut by Argento himself. Argento did a version, Argento did a version of um, edited uh, Romero's classic, Dawn of the Dead, one of the classic zombie films. Focus, we can make it focus, shut up. There you go, oh God, yeah. I want to suck your blood. I want to suck your blood. Shut up. Shh. Shh. We can do this. Yeah, we can do this. Um, that's good. I've bled all of my jeans now. But that soundtrack to Dawn of the Dead is an absolute classic. But it's such a strange soundtrack. That was my first experience of Goblin. Um, list, watch the Argento cut of Dawn of the Dead, it's mainly Goblin's music. And you'll see what I mean. It's the wackiest soundtrack uh, to a horror film. If I had to think of a wackier soundtrack to a horror film, it would be uh, Les, Yeux, Les, Yeux, Les Yeux Sans Visage, Eyes Without a Face. That was uh, Maurice Jarre did the soundtrack to that one. and. Maybe we will experience that one together, because I think that's one of the great horror soundtracks as well. But that one's wacky as, as fuck. And that was uh, Jean-Michel Jarre's dad who did the soundtrack to that one, if I'm correct, if I'm correct in my remembrance. I do remember things wrong with mercenaries. But this was the first time that Goblin worked with Argento. And perhaps their most famous piece together. Well, perhaps Goblin's most famous ever music was for Dawn of the Dead, but I think their, their most famous piece working together with Argento was probably Suspiria. 
And I think we're going to have to visit that one as well. I prefer Profundo Rosso. Profundo Rosso myself. But the main theme, the main theme from Suspiria is probably Goblin's defining moment as a band. School at Night. Obviously, if you've seen the film, you know about the school at night. Now, the problem you get these days when you load up something like A Profundo Rosso by Goblin is that the version you'll find today, unlike the version that was released originally, but only had like seven tracks on it, the version you'll find today has 29, 30, 31, 32, 3, 34, 35, like 36 tracks. We're just going to listen to the original disc today. But funny enough, the original disc does not have some of the defining music from the film. And that's what you often find. And I found the frustration with things like that is you try to find like the original soundtrack to uh, Blade Runner, another fantastic film score by Van Gallis. Can you actually find the actual original soundtrack from the film? You can't get hold of the bloody thing. What you find is Artistic endeavours are defined by what a human being is going to do. If a human being doesn't want to release it, it won't happen. Humans, my mercenaries. We should put the moon in charge of everything. But like I was saying earlier, listen to the bass work by Goblin. Well, you're talking, well, okay, just listen to everything. Fantastic bass work, incredible drumming, mad keyboard playing. There's a real jazz influence to this one. But listen to how up front in the mix up basses. The bass is punching, punching you in the face. Honestly, by the end there, that really did have um, a feel of a bit of Miles Davis or, uh, well, Miles Davis. The silent way, they just grew here. Okay, right, if we were to ask the members of Goblin from this era what their influences were, I think you're going to find it's a lot of jazz. see some of the madness you can hear some of the madness I'm talking about that that defines the Dawn of the Dead soundtrack actually if I went back and listened to the Dawn of the Dead sound soundtrack perhaps it would sound normal now I'm used to this I just remember listening to uh, watching Dawn of the Dead when I was a kid just thinking this soundtrack is completely crazy but perhaps as you get older what you define as crazy becomes more and more sane. Oh, 
I mean, we're talking percussion here. Rather than drumming. The kettle drums. Reprieve until the bass comes in. How much of a reprieve is this? Oh, brushes on the snare. It's that sort of marching band feel. But then the left ear. I see it, was, it almost feels like waking up on a sunny morning, but there's still an element of discord there. Whoa! I mean, this could, this could almost be a, a bass solo album, couldn't it? And there are so many people out there that think that um, bass is just a sort of background instrument. It has to be there to fill out the sound. Even some big bands like Oasis, you try and pick out the bass on what's a story on what's a story morning glory or um, definitely maybe. It's not there, it's just mashed in with everything, mashed in with the guitars. All that idea of the bass just playing what the guitars do and justice for all style. So you just can't distinguish what's going on. That's one way of doing it, right? The bass can be the bedrock, but it can also lift the music. Like just putting a stitch out. A stitch in crime, a stitch in time. A stitched up line. It gives you the sign. The place can be the sign, a stitching crime, a stitching under lime. Timeline, sign. I'll find you if you don't appreciate the bass. I'll find you if you don't appreciate the bass. After listening to this album. Oh. Okay, now let's appreciate the drums. Top of that game. I don't know how old these guys were at the time. I'm assuming they were youngsters. Holy shit. say traditional soundtrack and mad prog rock keyboards. Here 
here is for me the scariest theme from the film. There's something about the note choice when the children sing this line. It's like a nursery rhyme. There's a couple of notes in the melody that turn it from nursery rhyme to twisted murder story. But if you listen to old nursery rhymes, a lot of them are twisted murder stories. is lush. Here's a song that always reminds me of playing the game High Noon on the Commodore 64. Which isn't particularly horrifying. Unless you get shot in the face. It's quite horrifying. Bass is still killing it. It's good. It's like repeating the main melody again and again and just raising it and raising it and raising it. note to end on. After all the horror and the blood. I mean the literal blood. Happy Halloween. Over and...